writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court, your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. But um, I'm going to read a motion and ask for a first and a second. Uh, the items on the meeting agenda today constitute essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Betsy. Aye. Betsy, aye. All right. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Green says aye. Okay, the motion has passed. Ask for approval of today's agenda. Uh, approval of the minutes of October 2nd, 2020. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting? There's S, please. Is that Nora? Yes. Okay, Nora Kerr moved to approve. Is there a second? Second, Sarah Lee Woods. Sarah Lee seconded. Um, I call the roll to approve. Betsy Williams. Aye. Karen Robbins. Michael, Aye. Gil Michael Gillian. Aye. Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Bella Brown. Nora Kerr. Aye. Okay. The motion has passed. Any opposed? Mr. Chair, if you want, I vote I'm an aye also. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Welcome aboard. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm. I'm supposed to be joining the meeting. Who is this? This is Anthony Thomas. Okay. Well, we'll be um, getting to items on the agenda, and I assume you're here for an item on the agenda. Is that true, Mr. Thomas? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Sorry if I interrupted. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not I'm not familiar with, with how these phone in meetings work. So Yes, no, that's fine. So we'll welcome aboard. Okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome aboard. Okay. Note that items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission request that the items be removed from the consent agenda. <clears throat> are there any items that people are looking to remove, please? Okay. Bye. Bye. Chair? Yes. This is Council Member Stiles. How are you? I am very well, council member. I just wanted to take a moment to speak to the item that I have it's on. It yes. looks like it's on consent. It's G on consent, item G, a traffic signal. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> this light is desperately needed. I've had several accidents where cars have gone into people's homes on that corner. So I'm glad that it is on consent. I just wanted to speak my piece on that thank you very much for coming to speak um, on that matter all right are there anyone looking to remove an item from consent if not my goal here is to read the consent agenda and ask for approval okay uh, a request for the abandonment 
of a portion of the right of way along alley 922 from Wedgwood Avenue northward to Blakemore Avenue. Okay. Um, let me get back to the agenda. All right. Um, easement rights to be restored, to be retained, requested by S and M. E Inc. Item B, authorize a stock control on Dew Street at South Fifth Street. Item C, authorize no trucks over eight tons on Vandeveer Drive from Egan Circle to North DuPont Avenue, Egan Circle from State Route 45 to Vandeveer Drive, requested by Metro Public Works. Um, Excuse me. Sorry, I'm having some computer trouble here. Okay. Uh, authorized stop control on Fisher Drive at Windermere Drive, requested by Metro Public Works, item E. Authorized stop control on Fisher Drive at Renee Drive, requested by Metro Public Works. Item F, authorize a traffic signal at Haywood Lane and East Drive, requested by a resident. Item G, authorize a traffic signal at Bell Road and Rice Road, Bell Crest Drive, requested by Council Member Stiles. Item H, Authorized no trucks over eight tons on Ashford Trace from Mount View Road to Summercrest Boulevard. Requested by a resident. Item I. Authorized no trucks over eight tons on Summercrest Drive from Ashford Trace to Murfreesboro Pike. Requested by a resident. Okay, that is the consent agenda as read. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, I didn't hear my item on the agenda. Oh, I didn't hear my item on the agenda. Excuse me? I didn't hear my item on the agenda. Well, then it's not on the consent agenda. It must be on a different section of the agenda. This is just the consent agenda. That is correct, Mr. Chair. He uh, Mr. Thomas's item is under new business. New business. We'll get to your item shortly, Mr. Thompson. Okay. The consent agenda has been read. Is there a motion? Second. Second. Okay. We have a first and a second. Ms. Williams. Aye. Well, hang on, Mr. Chair. I, I did have one item of discussion before we vote. Okay, yes, Mr. O'Connell. It matters a ton in terms of the actual uh, material. On screen. Um, I believe A is actually counted for 17. I think you're, you're breaking up a little bit, Council Member. I think what you were saying is that mandatory referral is, is labeled in your district, and I think it's in Councilman Sledge's district. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Is that the West Avenue, Lakemore Avenue? Okay. Yes. I thought that was someone else's district. Okay. Mr. Chair. Needed to adjust that before we pass the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If we ask everyone to mute their microphones unless they are speaking, that will cut down on all the noise. Please mute your microphone when not speaking. Hey, thank you, Ms. Williams. Hey. Hi. Uh, thank you for the clarification, Chip. Do we need to update anything before we approve the consent agenda to correct that? Not necessarily. I've talked to the councilman, Councilman Sledge, earlier in the week, and he was supportive of the uh, consent item. 
my mistake. It's uh, not your, your district, even though we welcome your opinions on it. And then just just by way of a point of information on the agenda, when we get requests that are either departmental or from residents that are not uh, council members, given that we note the council district of each of these items, is notice typically given to council members for items on this agenda? Typically, that we do. I, I go through the council office for the notifications. I, every once in a while, I'll go directly to the council person, but I, I prefer to go through the council office. Um, but 99% of the time, I want the council person at least their opinion on the item before we bring it before you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so if I could get a roll call, please. Ms. Williams. Aye. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Uh, Ms. Gilman. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Aye. Okay. The consent agenda has been approved. Thank you, everyone. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, update on valet management and operations. Mr. Jeff Hammond, Metro Public Works. Mr. Hammond, available. If Mr. Hammond is not online, I believe Diane is online and she may can give us an update on where we are. Okay. Miss Marshall. Okay. Uh, Jeff is in the, in the conference room with me now and he's going to sign into my phone. Okay. Okay. There you go, Jeff. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, following up on last month's meeting, we have had uh, one meeting with our uh, stakeholder steering group uh, and presented to that body uh, a draft um, version of the parking policy as we have it uh, uh, at this point. We received some very good feedback. Two of the specific um, items that that body asked for was a little more information from some peer cities on how those places um, uh, have, have developed and charged uh, their parking, their valet parking fees, as well as what our uh, typical revenues are uh, in metered areas. And that's pertinent because part of the, the uh, formulation that we're working on is, as you might know, the code does require us to structure our valet fees based on some of the revenue lost at parking meters. So uh, that information has been compiled uh, and, and last week, um, we actually found that that information was very helpful in looking at our, our fee structure holistically. So we've um, put together a revised uh, policy, and we're looking at that from a legal standpoint right now. And Ms. Costonis is working very closely with us on that. We, we think by... Uh, as early as tomorrow, hopefully certainly this week, we'll have a revised proposal back to the stakeholder group and um, continue our discussions from that point. What our ultimate goal is, is to be back in front of this committee next month, the, the, the commission next month at the December meeting, uh, at which time we would present our our plan for a, a, uh, a change to our valet uh, collection policy that would be implemented uh, very soon after January 1st next year. Are there any questions, comments to Mr. Hammond, please? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Mr. O'Connell. Uh, Jeff, can you speak to how, how is this kind of constructed have you all done a, a peer city review have you looked at 
And I know we heard from Ms. DeMassimo from the mayor's office um, a couple of times over the past year as the transportation plan has been formulated. Um, what kind of, I guess, what kind of inputs, has there been any um, consultative support to the approach you all are pursuing? Help me understand um, the interaction with that stakeholder group, if you could, please. Sure. What we've done to this point is uh, we, we, we start with the code and what code tells us. It's it's fairly clear, actually. It says we, we will charge uh, for our valet spaces um, using two different components to a fee. One is a $50 application fee and then the other is uh, some formula which would quantify uh, what the parking revenue lost is. It doesn't go into a lot of specifics beyond that about how you actually put together that that formula or what that cost would be, but it, it clearly states it's, it's $50 plus the revenue lost at parking meters. And so that's where we started and, and we, but we've got some latitude, we believe, in how we interpret that second part of that code. And that's where we're really focused with our stakeholder committee to say, you know, how, how are we gonna calculate that? Is it our actual revenue lost versus it is, or is it the maximum potential revenue lost? Those are two pretty different numbers, as you as you might imagine. And and the way that uh, working with that steering committee and and their request for additional information from other cities has been very informative is because we've seen how other cities have have interpreted uh, very similar codes, how they make their calculations in terms of the revenue lost. And so we've we've got some options in that and and we've uh, used that information uh, looking at those other examples to come up with with a little bit of a hybrid that we have not yet shared with that committee but plan to do that this week so so that's where we are there's we have not gone out um, and and sought you know expert um, consultants in this area I, I think they do exist I think they're probably pretty specialized it's not something that we have the budget to do uh, but but we're kind of putting this together uh, in-house. I would say one other thing about it, which is um, we foresee this being somewhat of a, of a stopgap measure. We know that there are other parking um, uh, uh, parking strategies under development now, um, whether it's the smart parking, which is uh, more concentrated on up, updating our meters, modernizing our meter equipment, or it's more of the curb management uh, focus, which is a, 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 a broader look at how we're managing curbs uh, all over the city. Uh, so we think those things are coming uh, in early to mid next year. And so we think that whatever we're developing here has a, a relatively short life, but uh, we, we don't know. We don't know how, how or when those things are, are coming on board. And so we're, we're working um, kind of parallel track with those. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Hammond. I, I guess I am. I will express some confusion because I feel like when we began this conversation as a commission, um, you know, over a year ago, the suggestion was uh, twofold that we would have this sort of work prepared within a couple of months and that it would be uh, in concert with a, a consultant. So I'm just, you know, I'm still kind of scratching my head about um, a lot of what has elapsed between then and now. Mr. Hammond, you have any comment? Um, you know, we we make we make those um, requests for consulting help to do these types of studies. Sometimes we get them, sometimes we don't. In this case, we we don't have funds set aside to hire someone to do that work, uh, and and so this this is where we are. I mean, we're we're undertaking it uh, with in-house staff and using uh, some some volunteer help from. Um, we think very good resources from our, our steering group that are based here in Nashville and, and kind of know the, the lay of the land in terms of especially downtown work, but, but in, in all places that we have valet. So uh, I, I can't comment much more than that. Uh, okay. Any other comments from anyone? I just have one quick question, um, Nora. Um, 
Jeff, is the goal to have something that would need to be uh, approved by the council, or is it more of having um, changes to the process, kind of internal back end stuff, or is it both? Um, the latter. Uh, we're trying to minimize any changes to the code for now. That that doesn't preclude us from doing that in the future. For instance, I think we all probably think that the fifty dollar fee is is low, and we could certainly justify a, a higher fee than that. Um, but uh, given given that we're trying to do this on a on a fairly tight time frame, and the fact that we we don't know that it's going to last all that long we're trying to get the changes that we can in place now we can always revisit that uh, so our objective right now is to try to get something that can be interpreted within the existing code and then do more of a, a holistic uh, overhaul if needed in the future and and i'll say this too one of the first things that we started with talking with our our steering group about is the need to really focus this scope because as we've determined here in, in this committee and just in discussions with several of you, the, the parking issues are, are bigger than just valet fees. And, and, and but, but that's where we're gonna focus now. We think we, we need to stay focused on one aspect of this. And, and just like we might revisit in the future, we intend that there might be some uh, revisits to other aspects in the world of parking in general. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, this is Betsy, and um, I'm on yes. the steering committee, and um, and I want to thank Jeff and his group for the work that they're putting into this because it's it can be a little tedious and, you know, looking up different things, reading ordinances from other communities and compiling um, information regarding revenues and so anyway they've done a really good job and i look forward to hearing their update at our next uh steering committee meeting great all right thank you and we assume that you'll have some kind of draft mr hammond to distribute to the commission meeting in advance a week or more that is our goal yes sir okay thank you are there any other uh comments on this matter. Okay. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a briefing on the uh, the coordinated curbside parking project, uh, Derek Haggerty, Metro Public Works. Derek, are you still with us? I'm still with you. All right. No, thank you. So just to introduce myself for everyone, my name is Derek Hagerty. I'm an engineer here at Public Works. And uh, today we just want to give a quick summary on the Smart Loading Zone Pilot Program. So early this summer, Nashville was awarded a digital curb challenge grant to work with Ford. Uh, they're a company that assists cities in curb management. And we're gonna, and with this grant, we're just re-looking at the way we operate our loading zones. So I'm hoping this program uh, and the company itself, Ford, are not strangers to the commissioners. I know they've been in front of you before. This is a topic that's come up. Um, but I've invited Don Miller and Don Lisa Joaquin from Cord uh, to join us today, kind of refresh our memory on what Cord does and discuss what we've done to this point and really lay the groundwork for next the next commission meeting in December when we're gonna present some action items. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Donna Lisa to introduce uh, herself and just give everyone a quick refresher on what CORD is and what we're looking to do with this grant. Thank you, Mr. Hagerty. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Donna Lisa Joaquin. I'm a program manager at CORD and I am joined by my colleague, Don Miller, the vice president of policy and partnerships. As a refresher, CORD is a mobility platform working with the city of Nashville to manage their curb space, to reduce congestion, improve safety, and provide a better experience for everyone doing business or visiting downtown Nashville. As demand for curb space in cities surges, used for everything from parking to loading to outdoor dining, a well-functioning program to manage loading and commercial vehicle parking is essential to ensuring a thriving downtown. Uh, next slide, please. Earlier in the year, as Mr. Hegarty mentioned, Nashville applied to the Digital Curb Challenge to undertake a curb space management pilot program. 
Out of the dozens of applicants, Nashville was selected as one of four North American cities to participate in the Smart Zone program with CORD. The pilot programs in Omaha, Nebraska and Aspen, Colorado have launched. The pilot in West Palm Beach, Florida is set to launch in mid-January, and the Nashville, Nashville pilot is planned for an early February launch. The findings from all four cities will be used to help the cities and CORE to learn how to design these programs to work at best, uh, to work best at scale. Next slide, please. The goal of the six-month Nashville pilot program aims to improve curb access experience for delivery and service vehicle drivers, to support brick and mortar businesses, improve coordination, safety, and compliance during loading and service calls, and to promote downtown vitality and attractiveness in Nashville. Next slide, please. So smart zones are spaces along the curb dedicated to loading and loading, loading and unloading for certain hours of the day. Uh, the city of Nashville would identify the smart zone locations and prices and install signage at the zones. Drivers are then able to find, book, and pay for space using a smartphone app. Next slide, please. Drivers use a smartphone app called Core Driver to book and pay for space. Uh, drivers can also use the app to navigate towards loading zones. And here are some screenshots of what drivers see um, in the app. Would you uh, be able to just quickly cycle through the next few slides, please? And if a driver is part of a fleet, a fleet manager is able to create a profile to pay for and monitor their driver bookings. Uh, the next component is the enforcement team, and they would be using the smartphone app called Court Inspector to monitor vehicle authorization in the space. The enforcement team will be able to see if a driver is booked a space, uh, a booked space properly, and paid for the appropriate time by scanning license plates in a smart zone and responding to alerts. Uh, and lastly, for the city, the city again will identify the smart zone location, availability, and price, and be able to monitor usage and updates. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, an update, uh, monitor usage and update variables as needed. Uh, the city dashboard will provide analytics on usage, dwell time, percent occupancy of the spaces, enforcement scans all by uh, day and time, by vehicle type and location. Uh, now I'll hand it back to Mr. Hagerty to report on progress today. No, nope, thank you. Uh, you know, next, perfect. Yep, so what we've done so far is identified our pilot area. Uh, you know, the whole goal of this pilot is to gather as much data as we can so we can really inform this program when, or I guess I should say, if we choose to roll it out across the city. Uh, so to do that, we picked one of our heaviest loading zone areas, which is right in downtown Nashville. We're looking at a 12 square block area, Broadway to Union, first to fifth. Uh, for the purposes of this pilot, we're going to stay off Broadway, just a lot of activity going on there right now, and just a little easier to stay off that street. We are looking at that area. So to, to date, we've actually gone out and mapped the entire area. So what you're seeing on the screen, there's just a quick snapshot of the data we've gathered, anything downtown that affects parking. So we've mapped all the signs hydrants, curb cuts, uh, bike racks, anything that's down there. That's really going to help inform us uh, to pick the locations, which we're hoping to do this week. Uh, next slide, please. We've also begun the process of stakeholder outreach. The mayor's office is going to be reaching out through the downtown partnership to the local businesses. We'll also be contacting the fleets themselves, uh, kind of working on a top-down process there. And once we're ready to roll these zones out, we'll actually have people out on the street along with signage to help inform drivers. So kind of coming at it with the fleets from two different directions. Next slide, please. Yep, and what we've, and really the important part uh, for the commission is the program design and the rules that go into this program. And that's really what, what I wanna prep everyone for next week. So our goal with this pilot is to run it from the beginning of February through August, six month time frame. And really the data we gathered during this pilot is going to influence the rules for our smart loading zone program going forward. Uh, however, we do need rules in place to set fees to gather that data. 
So we're kind of in a catch-22 where we need both the rules and the data. So what we're proposing, and we can go to the next slide, one more actually, thank you, is that in December, we'll make a presentation, one, with the locations we've identified, and two, with a set of interim rules. So these would just be for the life of this pilot, six months, and allow us to, um, while still having rules, give us a little leeway to test different hypotheses. So you see some of the things uh, here that'll be in the rules, and this is coming through, uh, excuse me, coming through legislation that was passed in early September. So, you know, the first block you see there, permits and fees. Doing this pilot, we're gonna be playing around with fees a little bit to see what prices work best at what locations at what time. You know, if we set a fee too low, someone might feel comfortable sitting there for three hours, which is not what we want. We want people in these spots 15, 30 minutes moving on. If we set fees too high, uh, maybe, you know, people won't use it. So we're going to ask for a little leeway there. And you'll also probably see the fees broken down into 15-minute chunks. Uh, minimum curb loading space, we'll keep that pretty simple. Enhanced enforcement, we're really just going to be looking at signage and use of the court app for enforcement, which is not going to be how we ticket, really just how we identify if someone's paid or not. Um, eligibility of use, we're going to initially keep it open to all commercial drivers, methods of payment, performance monitoring, those are going to be pretty standard. But at the next meeting uh, in December here, we'll be presenting a formal set of rules. We hope to have those rules complete late this week, early next week. Uh, we'll get with legal to review them and have them to the commissioners well in advance of the next meeting. Uh, once the pilot is complete, We'll use the data we collected to create a new set of rules, which we think will look similar to what we're going to propose next month, but uh, just tightened up a little bit. So that's what we're looking at the way forward. I just want to open it up to questions now. Any, any comments or questions, commissioners? <clears throat> yes. Are you looking at this for a 24-hour period? Uh, we are not looking at it for 24 hours. Uh, it's probably going to align with our enforcement hours. You know, realistically, if someone books one of these spots and there's a vehicle parked there and we're not enforcing, it doesn't do them a lot of good. So if we don't have an enforcement arm active at the time, it's going to be very difficult to execute this program. Okay, so I have another question because I'm a downtown resident and I have to go get groceries and unload my car and so i'm i'm gonna pull up in front of my building and to unload my groceries but i'm gonna have to pay to do that correct so this program is only aimed at commercial loading and unloading this will not affect any residential loading thank you Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember O'Connell. Yes. yes. Thanks. Um, I guess this is probably a question for Donna Lisa. Um, with the, you know, with the kind of workflow you suggested there, um, with putting signs up and then identifying these as smart zones, I'm I'm sorry, I lost the connection there, Mr. O'Connell. There are going to be a number of I expect who do not have the app on their phone. Um, oh, I may have broken up here. Sorry, is my audio coming through? It is now, Mr. O'Connell. Okay, yeah, I think I had a blip on my connection. Um, there will be a period of time where people don't have the app available um so if if i pull up and i don't have the cord app and don't have either a compatible mobile device or an easy ability to download the app but i need to use that loading zone how does that how what's the workflow for that scenario sure as, as mr higgerty uh mentioned in the beginning one of the big aspects of the program is also outreach prior to launch and so that's a really part of like reaching out to fleets to make sure that they are um, signed up for the program, especially if they are part of a driver as part of a fleet, because potentially the fleet would be willing to pay on behalf of the drivers. And so that's 
one component and getting to them before they get to a loading zone. Uh, I think another and continued uh, outreach during the pilot launch. Uh, I think it's also important. Um, one thing that we have used in what in previous cities that there's a QR code on the smart zone sign so that helps ease the download. So um, the driver would scan their, their phone at the QR code and they'd be directed right to the download page. Uh, uh, for Nashville, we're suggesting a text to um, download so that there would be a text number on those signs at the loading zones uh, to get them easy directed to the website to download. Okay, that helps. But it, I mean, it does sound like in order to pay um, or to participate in the program, you will need the app. Correct, yes. And that is part of the pilot program strategy is that we want to be able to build it out quickly, but in the long term, the intention would be that it would be integrated into uh, whatever system uh, Nashville and the drivers have. Any other comments, questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, what do you? What is going to happen to people who cannot afford smartphones, who cannot afford to download an app, who cannot participate in this? What kind? Of, are we doing any kind of accommodations for people who don't have smartphones or apps or iPads? Yeah, so this program is really only aimed at uh, commercial drivers, those driving for companies. And Ford may have some of the, some more of this data on this. I think they shared it with me earlier, but very, very high percentage of those drivers and companies do have these devices readily available. And you know, another part of this, we're looking at five to 10 spots downtown. There's gonna be plenty of other parking. This is really just giving those drivers the convenience of booking the spot beforehand, ensuring that it's open so that they can pull directly up, don't have to circle around. This will not be uh, the only types of commercial loading zones available downtown. All right, any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just a quick, Clarification, uh, I think I understand it, but Nashville is an event city and often there are multiple um, events that require um, loading and unloading downtown like CMA Music Fest, for instance. So this would or would not affect a large event that would be downtown. It potentially could. Uh, like I said, we're only looking at five to 10 spaces. So if they're looking to do their loading or unloading in these spaces, it could absolutely affect them. Um, you know, really just requiring them to pay for the time to use that curb, no different than our parking meters. In addition to that, like one flexibility is the ability for Nashville at any point turn on or turn off a smart zone. And so if, like, if necessary, that smart zone may be inactive for a day if needed. Got it, thank you. All right, any other comments? Yes, I've got one. Okay. Uh, the gentleman was referring to, um, this is aimed at commercial drivers who've got smartphones. Well, um, not all companies may have that as so you work for a commercial business like, like I do. They do not let you put any other apps on your smartphone than what they've got. And if they don't happen to have that app on there, you're not going to be able to use it. And the gentleman said most do. Well, most is not all. And if that was me, I would be really frustrated trying to, you know, trying to find a way to, to park now and say, well, you need that app before you can do this. Well, myself, I'm not good at using computers or or ask anyway, I can't seem to get very many of them to work anyway. But if it's not on your company's phone, you're not going to be able to put it on. Uh. Hi, good afternoon. This is Dawn. If I could just um, chime in, you know, um, one, one benefit, I think, um, in Nashville's case of 
of not being the, the first of these pilots is that um, this pilot will benefit from the things we're learning in the other cities um, where it's been rolling out. And, and often really when there is a driver um, who has a phone that isn't authorized to add other apps and things like that, what happens during those first couple weeks of the program where, where we're not issuing, no one's issuing citations. It's really like having a conversation with the driver to let them know what's going on. Often, if that's the case, um, the person doing the outreach in the street will say like, what, what's the name of the person who manages your team and that person's phone number? Um, and then someone from CORD or from the city gets on the phone and speaks with, with management there. And what we're finding so far is that usually once the, the fleet knows that this is a city program, this is the way that their drivers can get access to space that is useful to them, um, a lot of them have been able to kind of open up the phones to be able to download another authorized app. Oh. All right, thank you. So I think maybe in the interest of time, we'll, uh, I think we've exhausted most of the questions. We'll move forward, okay? Thank you all very much for the presentation and we'll look forward to getting information well in advance of our next meeting in December, okay? Thank you. All right. Next item is a request for a valet zone at 310 Gay Street, requested by Premier Parking. We did receive the application for the valet parking at 310 Gay Street. According to the code, the standard is two spaces, but they're requesting four spaces. This is in front of the new hotel called Town Place Suites, and it is a 24 7 zone. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to defer this at least until we've gotten the valet recommendations in December and, and go with a temporary permit till such time. I, I think that makes sense. Is there a second? I second that. This is Betsy. All right. First and a second. Uh, all in favor, Ms. Williams. Mr. Chair, real quick before yes. we go into the vote. Um, can I ask staff, does this require any removal of metered parking? The development removed some parking spaces when they started the project and they've done a curb cut at this location. So therefore they're utilizing a curb cut plus also two adjacent spaces that were metered prior to the development. All right, so I think this is a this is one of the cases that was under consideration as we began ballet, right? We had metered parking here that was removed for the purposes of development that under the way we have been doing this historically uh, would not be considered removal uh, for the purposes of the valet permit. Um, Mr. Hammond, I do think your uh, committee is is reviewing that. Hold on one moment when Jeff comes back to the phone. Okay. We are, and this is this is kind of a textbook example of why we're looking at what we're looking at. And so this would certainly fall under the uh, the new policy. Okay, great. All right, this is maybe then a follow-up question for legal. If we issue a temporary valet, but the commission decides we want uh, uh, to have the permit itself issued under the terms of the recommendations, will we have the flexibility to do that? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm participating from my phone and I've never done that before and so I wasn't sure if it would work. This is Teresa Castonis with Legal. Um, as, as long as I am able to be heard, I wanted to remind everyone on the call that we all have to identify ourselves before we speak. Um, so um, with respect, with response to um, the council member's question, um, I, I think that the lane closures, which is what is used as a temporary measure, is, is a separate um, authority um, than the um, than 1241, the, the valet parking permit um, provision. Um, so um, certainly at the point when the commission adopts new rules in terms of the valet parking um, 
there will be an effective date going forward from which those provisions will be in force. Um, so anyone who has a um, temporary permit, maybe what we could um, provide as those temporary permits are issued going forward is that those permits will expire on whatever date the commission adopts um, enforceable rules um, on this issue, and, and then they will have to comply with those new rules um, going forward from that point. Um, does that address the question? Thanks, Ms. Costones. It, it mostly does, I think. I guess what I want to make sure is that we would not be creating a scenario whereby the commission has been pretty clear thus far that this is, in fact, one of the various scenarios we're trying to um, capture, uh, right, that we know from, to your point, a road closure permit that was not specifically a valet request, meter parking was removed but it was removed in an area that was about to be for the project in development, uh, a request for a valet permit. Um, so to me, we would want to capture that loss of parking revenue um, in a valet permit going forward uh, as appropriate. I guess what I want to avoid is issuing a temporary valet permit, um, the terms of which would result in a grandfathering claim um, you know, some some form of vesting uh, that we might not be anticipating today if we issued that valet permit. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, uh I'm looking at um, Jeff and Diane as I say this. I believe that the temporary lane closure permits are um, revoc revocable at will by Public Works. Diane is nodding, so I think I have that right. Um, so I, I, I think that they would, um, that Public Works would kind of have control over at, at whatever point they can terminate those permits. Okay. Right. No, I guess what I'm saying though is, I would not want to get in a scenario whereby we issue a temporary valet permit uh, that was under the old rules such that only the old rules would apply even if the applicant were then issued a, a permanent valet under the new rules. Okay. So I, I think that the, the temporary permit would not actually be under those rules um it would be kind of just at the discretion of public works um with whatever conditions they choose to set on that permit which could include compliance with 1241 um uh and and its requirements um so i think that there um there's no kind of vested right if that's what you're asking um that the permittee would have to continue to operate under the old rules once the new rules go into force. Is that what you're getting at? That is exactly what I'm getting at, and I think you just raised a good point. I think what I'd like to really do um, is in the deferral. I'd like the temporary permit to be issued under the terms of 1241 since it's already on the books. Okay. So I guess, Mr. Chair, let me let me update my my motion. I'd like to for one meeting uh, with a temporary permit to be issued uh, as fully compliant with 1241 as it exists today. Mr. Chair, I think you're muted. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second, Sarah Lee Woods. Ms. Woods, you have seconded the motion. Okay. Any other comments? I'm going to make the roll call. Ms. Williams. Aye. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Ms. Kern. Aye. 
Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, the motion is passed. Thank you very much. Okay. The next item on the agenda is an appeal of staff denial for parking on the east side of Country Way Road requested by a resident. Mr. Thompson, is this your item? And that's my item. We've got a problem, an ongoing problem, with some, neighbor, some of it is neighbors who continually will leave their own driveway open. They, leave, they live across the street from us, or across the cul-de-sac from us. They will constantly leave their driveway empty and leave the front of their house empty. They'll park in front of our house. And then sometimes they have large numbers of people that will park in front of our house. Okay. They'll, they'll leave their vehicles there all night. And then we've got people who just park there on and off. Whenever a salesman comes there, parks there. And during the evening, it causes my kids trouble sleeping. I mean, wait, you know, looking out and seeing a car park there in front of their house. And it, it makes us really... It makes us all uneasy to constantly have cars parked in front of our house, and people frequently park in front of there so they can access the trails that are back towards the lake area. Okay. And I guess it's really it's, it's it's a violation of our privacy and our safety because it's constant. All right, Mr. Knopf, do you have uh, is there a map of this that you can pull up for? Commissioners, please. Yes, this is Chip. Uh, can you see that on your screen there, Mr. Chair, with the red line? Yes. Okay. This is a this is a really tough case for us and, and Mr. Thomas. Is we understand his condition and his situation, but when we engineers don't have anything technically to support our decision, <coughs> we have to rely on this commission. So, in a nutshell, there's nothing in the books that we should um, prohibit parking on this cul-de-sac. The road is wide enough. Um, it's not interfering with circulation. And that's the things we look for. Um, it's kind of like an always stop warrant. We just didn't meet the warrants to put up uh, no parking signs. Um, as far as the trails go, we're working with the water department on probably putting up some signage that say no, no access to trailheads and that sort of thing. But the parking just didn't meet our specs and our policy to put up no parking signs. And when that happens, we require a petition from the neighbors and we don't have it yet. So I understand the difficult position we're in with Mr. Thomas and his his needs. I just didn't have a, a way to justify putting up the no parking signs. Yes, it just gets to be really people, people will park there late at night and rev their engines. And it makes it difficult for my kids to sleep. But my, I've got two kids. Two of my three kids who live there who suffer from anxiety. When somebody pulls up there and parks at night, or they wake up and see a car parked out there, it really interferes with them being able to get restful sleep. And one thing I point out is these neighbors, they've got enough space to park in front of their own homes. They just choose to park in front of ours instead. And it's really, it's, it's very annoying. They, they sometimes have parties where they've got large numbers of people. They take up the entire call the sack and you know, I've talked to them about it. And they they carry on about uh, a few years before I moved there, a car got totaled in that call the sack because somebody was speeding through there and didn't stop. And then um, they said, by parking in front of my house, it prevents the car from being or something, but it just it's very disturbing okay. to us to have somebody else's car parked in front of our house constantly when there's room at the owner's home to park it in front of their own home. Okay. And one of the parties and the salesman, the Jehovah's Witness, people who constantly park in front of our house and you know, they walk right through the garden and, and stomp everything. Well if I feel like Really? Okay. There's really All no right. need for us to have public parking there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Okay. Any other um, 
How, how would enforcement happen in this scenario, please? Are you asking me? No, we're not. I'm asking staff. So I'll. This is Chip. I will. Uh, I will defer to our um, Mr. Gilliland, Sergeant Gilliland, on this one. I, that would be a very difficult um, task. I'll say that. Yeah, I don't think it would fall to the area where it would be uh, enforced by the the meter patrol out there from from public works. So it would have to be uh, well, the precinct out there that 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 area falls in their their jurisdiction, um, and it's not going to be enforced. I mean, it'd be enforced unilaterally. I mean, whichever V, if there was no parking signs out there and they were to be out there, then whatever cars were parked there would be ticketed. Um, they, it's, it's not a towable offense. They would just receive a parking ticket. Yeah, well, that would do the trick. They wouldn't want the parking ticket. Okay. That's all I'm asking. I'm asking. Okay, Mr. Thompson, thank you. We're, we're going to ask questions of commissioners and staff. Okay, any other uh, comments or questions, please? Has the council person weighed in on this issue, please? I have not heard from Council Member Lee. Uh, I have some messages in to them, um, but I have not gotten a response yet. Okay. Uh, Chair, this is Karen Robbins. Um, yes, Mr. Robbins. Chip, you mentioned that um, this would require a petition from the neighbors, and that would that be helpful to Mr. Thompson's case? That is, yeah, that's what we. This is Chip. That's that's what we do in cases where we don't have again the width of the road doesn't allow us to go out and put signs or any of the other technical reasons. We just simply say, can you get a petition? from the neighbors so we don't get in the middle of a battle out there. So yeah, if we had a petition and I can, I can get in touch with the council person to help with that perhaps, but if we had a petition, this would have been a much easier case and it would have been on consent. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay. Commissioners, any other comments about this matter? I, I would vote to disapprove. I certainly, um, it sounds like there's definitely some issues, but it sounds like it, without a petition, um, it would be us getting involved in a, a potentially in a neighborhood dispute. So I think we should should wait until we hear both from the other neighbors and the council member before making a, a permanent lasting change. All right. So we have a motion to disprove. Is there a second? This is Karen. I'll second that. All right, Ms. Robbins has seconded. All right, any further comments on the motion to disprove? Okay, I'm going to take the roll call. Ms. Williams. Aye. Uh, Ms. Robbins. Aye. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Okay. Ms. Kern. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Aye. Okay. The uh, the motion to disprove has been approved. Uh, my suggestion, Mr. Thompson, I would ch chat with your council member and look and see further suggestion of getting the additional neighbors behind you in this matter, please. Say it's, it's Thomas, not Thompson. Okay, also, sorry. Okay, now listen, uh, I heard somebody else, I heard Chip, I think, mention the uh, come communications to the council member and it not been answered. That council member will not answer any phone calls, will not return okay. messages, will okay. not do anything. All right, well, thank you. We're going to move on to the next item now, Mr. Thompson. Thomas, okay. The next item is 
Appeal the staff decision to de deny removal of an all-way stop at Annex Avenue and Robertson Avenue requested by a resident. This is in Council District 20. I think Ms. Roberts is on the phone. Is that you, Ms. Roberts? Yeah, this is Council Lady Roberts. Yes, are you here to speak to this matter? So, oh, sorry about that. I have a little a dog. No, that's okay. Dog issue right here. So this has typically been a um, four-way stop that my neighbors love. Um, I know that there was a, is a resident that's speaking against it today that um, does want it removed. But in the history of time, there's only been one crash. And so there, the, the advantage of this is there, these are two collector roads. And that provides right of way control for pedestrians and cars, which is really a huge benefit. And because we don't have sidewalks on the street, this stop sign ensures safety. So I'm asking that you please leave it in place. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there another person wishing to speak on this matter? Yes, um, my name is Elaine Korn, and I had just asked for this to be looked at, and I had really wanted to discuss it with a commission member or, you know, Chip Knopf beforehand, but that hasn't happened. I was just kind of grasping at straws as to what to do in this area to kind of mitigate the noise from the trucks, because when the trucks stop, and they sometimes, they don't just stop at the stop sign. There's a line of trucks. They, they stop, you know, progressively. And the, the stopping noise, especially if they use jake braking, and then the gear up noise is just pretty obsessive in the area. So all I was looking at was what could be done that might help mitigate some of the noise that occurs from that. And I'm not saying that this is the, the best solution, I was just trying to look at something in light of not being able to discuss it with anybody, what could possibly be done to help in this situation. I live there, I live on James. There's a tremendous amount of traffic on James. Um, I don't know what you all did to look at this. I know there was a traffic study and I discussed it with the company, uh, the person who did the traffic study. And there's actually more cross traffic on James and Robertson than there is on Annex. Um, because you're feeding from the back of the nations and Centennial and all of the commercial that's back there. And they're all coming to Robertson to go um, to I-40, or a lot of the traffic just goes across. James is called Westboro on the other side, and they go to Charlotte Pike. And I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm an expert, but I've been out there and I've spent a lot of time observing the traffic patterns. And so I just thought that if we could do away with the four-way stop, seems like it would be better at James actually due to the amount of traffic. But anyway, be that as it may, I'm looking for something to help mitigate the noise from those upwards of a thousand trucks a day that come down this residential street, not once, but twice, because everyone that goes in comes back out again. So you've got double the fun. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I'm open to anything, any suggestion okay. that anybody might have to help with what's going on in this area. All right. Chip, do you have warrants on this intersection, please? Hello, this is Chip. Um, <clears throat> Corby, do you have the slide with the numbers? So, so you see the numbers are, they're not quite there for what we look for in the, you know, always stop warrant with the 83%, 17%. But the important part for this one is, the intersection of two collectors and on the bottom of that slide, and I know it's hard to see if you're on the phone for sure, but in that one hour count we did, we had five pedestrians crossing the road and it's just not a good situation with all those trucks and pedestrians trying to cross without sidewalks out in that area. So the stopping and starting braking noise and, and the engine noise is something we've said at, the, at this commission for years and years about always stops. And I understand Ms. Corn's concern because that, that's a legit item that we look at. Um, unfortunately, the right of way control here is more important as far as we're concerned and the always stop should stay. Well, let me just add something as far as pedestrian traffic. There is, is 
Please say, please. I'm sorry, Elaine Corn. I'm the. Yeah, please requester. identify yourself when you okay. go to speak. All Thank right, you. sorry, Elaine Corn, the requester. Uh, as far as pedestrian traffic goes, there's very few people that cross down Annex to go to cross Robertson. You do have a uh, sidewalk on the. Um, it would be the north side of Robertson that goes to Annex, and then you have no sidewalk beyond that. You do have a sidewalk on Annex going towards Charlotte Pike, on which would be the um, the east side, and there's just not a lot of pedestrian traffic there. I mean, I could understand that if there if there was. In fact, they're looking to put sidewalks on James because you have a lot more pedestrian traffic on James. People basically, they're not crossing the street there. People are out, maybe they're walking their dogs, but I mean, there's very little pedestrian traffic on Annex crossing Robertson. There's just no, re there's no need to, there's not like there's school children that are coming to get to a bus stop. None of that. I mean, I live there and I've watched this and, and Chip, can, this is Mary Carolyn Roberts. Hey, um, how, in your perspective, how many is, is five a large number or a small number of pedestrians? This is Chip. Um, well, we only did a one hour count, one hour sample. So five pedestrians in, in a one hour on a weekday in the middle of a residential area. Is, I mean, it's not as a, a, a extreme amount, but it is quite a few for the middle of the day in a, in a neighborhood like that, especially versus those trucks. I mean, that's, that would just be a bad scene if we remove an always stop and, and unfortunately someone were to get hit. That's what I'm mostly concerned about. And I think a lot, this is Mary Carolyn, Council Lady uh, Roberts. I think what we all know is coming down the pike is the trucks are going to be off of Robertson Road by the end of the year when the bridge is built. So, Keeping the stop sign may not be for today's pedestrians, but I think future they're putting sidewalks. And when we're having retail and walkable spaces at these, this is going to be a much more walkable. So it's pretty high, but I think going forward that we will have more walkability. Okay, but well, this is Elaine Corn. I'd like to address that point. I know that your person was out there counting around three or three thirty in the afternoon, but I'm going to tell you, if you go out there any other time in the day, you're not going to see. Maybe if you see one person walking on Robertson, the pedestrians are just not there. Like I said, I live there. I've been many an hour out there watching. I videotaped the trucks. I mean, I put a lot of time into it. I'm not just not just coming at this with absolutely no knowledge. I'm not an urban planner, so I don't know what the best solution is. But there's no walkability. Come on, Council Member Roberts, you've been out there, you said, for five years. There's no walkability in this neighborhood anywhere. It just doesn't exist because it's too dangerous. Even on James, I mean, people basically go to the alleyways to walk because there's there's just no walkability in this area. So after living in the over okay. here for 11 years, I really have found that the neighborhoods are all becoming more walkable and removing the stop sign would be a, a farce. So I would love for you all to vote on it if you could. And I'm asking for you to leave the stop sign. Okay, all right, let's, uh, let's hear from, uh, uh, is there any conversation here about any other alternative than an always stop, like a traffic circle or anything else? Is that part of any improvements? This is Chip. Um, well, Council Lady Roberts did mention the biggest change in that area is a proposed bridge that would send the trucks out a different direct uh, way. Um, we did not look at a roundabout or traffic circle. Um, not saying that's off the table, with, but it would be um, it would be down the road at best due to funding and planning and that sort of thing. This is Elaine Corn. I want to address the bridge being done at the end of the year. The permit to do this construction to do the road from Robertson and the bridge over Richland Creek, so that at least the quarry trucks can exit Cockrell Bend and not through the neighborhood. That permit was issued a year ago. It is still not approved. And currently it is with TEMA. 
for to to look at the floodplain aspect of it. And I haven't this been is Mary to... Carolyn Roberts. That's correct. That's incorrect information. I spoke with him yesterday. FEMA has no had the permit. They're moving forward. Well, that, that's what that's what the city told me. I'm not making that up. I have an email okay. from the city. Excuse me, excuse me, please. I, I'm not trying to get into a conversation between a dueling conversation here between a council member and a constituent. If we we're trying to keep the matter at hand, please. So, right. uh, please. So, uh, commissioners, any other comments, questions, please. Hey. Can I make Hello? one last? Can I make one last statement? This is Elaine Corn. Yeah, please. This will be your last statement, Miss okay. Corn. Please. Just, I want the commission to understand that there's no way this bridge and road is going to happen this year. I mean, you're the people on this commission that that know anything about building. I mean, the permit, according to the city, has not been approved, and. Okay. They've got to build a road and a bridge. So okay. if that's not going to happen for a year or more, then I guess we're saying that there's nothing that can be done to mitigate the situation in the neighborhood. I just want to make sure that's that's what you're going to do. Okay. Thank you for your comment, please. All right. Okay. So, Jeff, just to make sure I'm clear, there's an all there's currently an always stop there. How long has that always stopped in there? This is Chip. Well, the books, the, the, the books that we go by says since 1968, the uh, council member and I were kind of scratching our heads because we think we've looked at this intersection within the past five years or so, but the books are saying since the sixties. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, and, and I would like to go ahead and just make a motion to deny the item and, and keep the stop sign. Um, certainly hope we can find other solutions. And, and we have talked at length at times about the always stops, but I think because there are two collector streets um, and have been some crashes, even with, with stop signs in place, unfortunately, I, I don't know of any other solution short term. So hopefully the um, long term solutions can be pursued. But I think for now, it seems like we should keep the stop sign. Okay. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second on this motion? Second, this is Miss Woods. Miss Woods has made a second. Okay, we have a first and a second, and the result would be to leave the always stop in place. Okay, any other comments from commissioners? Okay, if not, I'll take the roll. Miss Williams. Aye. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. All right. The motion has been approved. Thank you very much for everyone for participating in that item. Thank you, Council Thank Member. You. Thank you, Ms. Corn. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is an appeal of staff decision for reinstallation of an all-way stop at Nashboro Village and Flint Rock Court, an authorized reduction in speed limit on Nashboro Boulevard from Murfreesboro Pike to Bell Road from 35 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour, requested by Council Member Porterfield and Ms. Vivian Wilhoy, president of the Nashboro Village Homeowners Association. Okay, thank you for your patience while we waited to get to your item. Who is here with us on this item? Ms. Wilhoy, are you still with us? Hello? Hi. Mr. Knopf, can you give us some background on this while we wait for yeah, yeah, this, this is Chip. Um, I just sent you a, 
a letter of support about two o'clock this afternoon from Council Lady Porterfield. Um, she, she was unable to attend today. She's got some family issues going on. But <coughs> she is supportive of the vision of the always stop. In talking with Ms. Wilhoyt, <clears throat> her and the HOA are adamant about wanting the always stop. The only reason, the reason I have it on an appeal is because it doesn't meet the warrants. Like, unlike Annex, where it's two collectors meeting, this is a collector in a local roadway, and the traffic volumes just aren't there to support <clears throat> the installation of an always stop. The speed study did support lowering the speed limit, so okay. my recommendation is to um, leave the traffic control as is, as a two-way stop, but go ahead and recommend the uh, reduction in speed limit. I do wish uh, Ms. Wilhoyt was online because I'm here. Okay, there she okay, great. I've been trying to unmute me and I've been waving. I guess you guys can't see me. No. Okay. Oh, there you are. Now I can see you. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Do you want me to wait until you finish? Um... Yes, let Mr. Knopf finish and then we'll take sure. your comments, Ms. Yeah, Wilhoyt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, it. That's it. This is Chip again. That That's it. Um, the testimony of Ms. Wilhoyt and the neighbors <clears throat> is. Um, the part we always like to hear from the, the numbers are on your screen there um, the distribution and volume the speeds weren't um, out of control we do want to lower the speed limit but uh, Ms. Wilhoyt and the neighbors have uh, more to say okay well good evening everyone good evening chairman green and the honorable yes. members of the uh, traffic and parking commission um, uh, I am Vivian Wilhoyt uh, I live at 1029 Flintlock Court in Nashville, which is located in the Nashville Village community. Thank you for this opportunity to appeal the denial and ask for the approval of the three-way and two-way stop signs and lower the speed limit from 35 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour and 25 miles per hour in some sections of the Nashville Boulevard. I'm honored to serve uh, as the president of the Nashville Village Homeowners Association at um, which is also called NVHOA. The NVHOA community is uh, a residence of more than 800 um, families, and it consists of single family homes, condos, townhomes, and apartment residential living. The NVHOA uh, president, uh, board of which I'm president, is made of 15 members representing nine sub associations. Uh, recognizing the dangerous speed traveled daily by most of the most utilizing Nashville Boulevard as a cut through to go from Murfreesboro Road to Bell Road and vice versa, the board members passed a motion to ask through the president, which is me, for speed reduction, midway stop signs on this continuous road and speed tables. Now, we understand that the decision for speed tables must be decided by the traffic calming division, and we hope for a positive confirmation from traffic and calming. Uh, from traffic coming, but to the speed reduction to 35 slash 25 miles per hour and the three-way, two-way stops is critical to help us to reducing the speed on Nashboro Boulevard, some call it the speedway. This request is identical to the midway stop signs that are presently located on Andrew Jackson Park Parkway, which I was just there yesterday, and on Bell Mead Boulevard. The Andrew Jackson Parkway and Bellme Boulevard are excellent examples of a three plus mile stretch boulevard with medians in a neighborhood compared to the Nashboro Boulevard that needs the same type of midway stop sign apparatus to use to slow down motorists in the same way they are established on Andrew, Andrew, uh, Andrew Jackson Parkway and Bellme Boulevard. The three-way and two-way stop signs will not only slow down speeding motorists, it would also address a very dangerous curve on the boulevard that has sent many speeding motorists into the creek at the Flintlock intersection. Mr. Terrence Scott, who lives at 1648 Double Tree Lane, has witnessed from his balcony numerous accidents and have helped pull many motorists, numerous motors, who have landed in the creek at the Flintlock intersection. Now, this is the words of Mr. Scott. When you ask him, what is it that we need to do? Mr. Scott says, it's that damn curve. 
and the stop sign will help to end the accidents and slow down the speeders. It's too costly to straighten the curve. This is what he says. Put in the stop sign and lower the speed limit. Hey, quote, unquote, unquote. That's his words, and it sounds good to me. So as president of the NVHOA, the stop sign will also help to prevent us from having to frequently replace one of 35 underground lighting light poles that the community paid for. For the fourth time, we are having to replace the underground decorative light pole, and now we are obtaining cost analysis to move the frequently hit light pole to another location. Finally, I hope, uh, well, first I wanna say this, we're thankful to have the support of council member Delisha Porterfield with her letter of support that you should have before you, and we like to have that also added into record. So finally, I hope that you have the opportunity to also review an extensive email that I sent to Mr. Chip North that I asked to send to each of you. And it shows pictures and videos regarding our three-way and two-way stop sign to reduce to the 30 to the 30 miles slash 25 miles speed limit and installation of the speed tables request, which we understand does not fall within your purview. So on behalf of the Nashville Village Homeowners Association Board, we ask you please for the approval of our request for the lower speed limit and the three-way and two-way stop signs. Thank you for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you for your excellent comments. Um, any other comments from uh, staff or commissioners? Is there a motion? I move to approve the request for the stop sign and the lowering of the speed limits. Hey, that's Miss Woods who just made that request. Who is anyone to second, please? I'll second. I do have one question. This is Councilmember O'Connell. Yes, ask away, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Wilhoy. Uh, I guess help me understand with uh, with the motion on the table, Mr. Knopf, is the uh, is the request being made by the community? Uh, it sounded to me like this was. Uh, uh, somewhat different than what staff were ready to recommend, right? Like the, the, it looks like the request, um, uh, an old way stop, and staff were recommending a two way stop. Is that correct? So, this is Chip. So, we're, bottom line is we were making a decision on an all way stop, but because of the geometrics of the intersections because Nashboro is a splitted, split median roadway, as you see in that picture there. Um, so some people call them two-way stops, some people call them all-way stops, but it, it, bottom line is you will have to stop from any approach at Nashboro or in Flintlock. Okay. Gotcha. So I, I guess just help me understand, are you, is the staff recommendation different than what is on the table right now? The staff recommendation was to, this is Chip again, the staff recommendation was to approve the speed limit reduction and to deny the always stop because of the volumes, um, the difference in the volumes of Nashboro versus Flintlock. I see, thank you. Okay. All right, all right, we have a first and a second. Are there any other comments? Okay. If not, I'm going to take the roll. Miss Williams. Aye. Miss Robbins. Aye. Miss Robbins. Okay. Mr. Gillian. Aye. Miss Woods. Aye. Miss Kern. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. None opposed. Uh, Miss Wilhoyt, your request has been approved thank you so very much i appreciate each and every one of you and your public service to davidson county thank you thank, thank you. you you are thank welcome you. all right okay i think the last item on the agenda is authorized 24 7 passenger loading zone at 1212 9th avenue north requested by 
Thompson and Hutton Engineering. And this is a deferred item. That is right. Mr. Chair, yeah. sorry, this is this is Council Member O'Connell. Um, since this one is in my district, I did confer with the Historic Buena Vista Neighborhood Association, and they they would like to discuss this um, application with the applicant. I don't know uh, if staff have the ability to convey that to the applicant. That would be ideal. But I think on on that basis, I would like to defer for one more meeting. So I'd like to move a one meeting deferral. All right. We have a motion for a one meeting deferral by Mr. O'Connell. Is there a second? Second, which is Sarah Lee Woods. Ms. Woods has a second. Okay, all in favor, Ms. Williams. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Gillian. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Okay. Aye. The motion Aye. has been deferred till our next meeting. Okay. Are there any other items for the good of the group? It looks like we're at the end of our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Chair, one Aye. last thing. Thank you for a productive meeting, first of all. Secondly, let's do our, if everything comes around in December, let's start thinking about our elections, our annual elections. Okay. okay. <laughs> I will make a motion to adjourn, Michael Gillette. There is a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.